we're going to show some of the stuff that we've been building at uh, Hike. Uh, how many of you have used Hike? Wow, that's good. <laughs> uh, so for those who have not used, you probably might know Hike is a messaging platform. Uh, we have 100 million users that use the platform. Uh, we have a 40 billion uh, messages per month kind of uh, transaction going through the system. Uh, so, and obviously we support uh, all platforms, Windows, iOS, and Android. Android being the biggest market in India. So we have a pretty strong uh, user base on Android. So for an application of this scale, which is running at uh, you know 100 million users and supporting all kinds of devices, what are some of the typical challenges you would anticipate in this kind of an application? So scalability is one challenge for sure, right? Then we talk about the cross-platform, especially with the fragmentation in Android. That could be a pretty challenging thing. Uh, plus a large base, uh, large user base that we have ends up using like a very l wide variety of phones, and a lot of them also tend to be on the lower end of the market phones, right? Uh, so when you have lower end market phones, uh, one of the typical challenges you will see is performance related issues, but also in general, the overall experience of the app might not be as great, right? So we've done a lot of interesting tweaks to make that as fast as possible, plus uh, network, right? That's another uh, aspect that kicks in, right? Like majority of the people still e end up using 2G network in India. Right, so you want this kind of a messaging app which allows you to send uh, files, videos, images, all kinds of things to work seamlessly on a 2G network without breaking any functionality. So now, let's imagine you are in charge of testing this app. Right? What kind of uh, things you would do? Uh, we used to follow a 15 day uh, cycle uh, into shipping into production. Now we moved it to a 30-day cycle, predominantly because we realized that our consumers are not going to pull a new version every 15 days. So we actually moved to a 30-day cycle to adjust to what our consumer is. But we had a pretty short uh, release cycle. And so if you're releasing every 15 days, right, what are the kind of things that you need to make sure from a testing point of view? And it, I'm sure it's pretty obvious that you can't do this manually. Right, considering the number of functionality that we have, the different kinds of phones that we need to support, uh, and if you want to be shipping into production every 15 days, it's almost impractical to try and do this manually. Right? So Vivek and I am going to talk about uh, some of the things and also demonstrate how we've actually gone about trying to do these tests. Uh, we have just have a series of demos where we will try and give you a quick preview of how uh, the automation suite is built and how it's run. And then we'll dive into a little bit more details around uh, what are kind of some of the tweaks we have done and some future plans that we have. Uh, of course, uh, by no means we think we have uh, solved all the problems. There's still a lot of things to be done. But it's in a decent shape where it's actually getting used every day in our company. So we wanted to uh, you know, showcase what we have so far. All right. Uh, so with that kind of a quick context uh, setting, I'll hand it over to Vivek to jump straight into a quick demo. Thank you. So, uh, testing such a big application, which requires multiple devices to communicate with each other, right? When you send a message, it gets to your friend. And you, one of the example I'll take is a group chat, where you add, say, 10 members, or even more than that. There is no limit for that right now. Other type of example that I'll take is file transfer. So, uh, with the earlier model that we use in automation over the client server architecture, where we used to send a message from one client and go to hit our server API to verify whether the message is uh, has been received by the server or has been entered into the DB. There was an API call that we were checking. But we found that it was not actually a real world scenario that we are simulating. That means if I am sending a message to you, whether it is appearing on your mobile, mobile screen or not, I have transferred a file, whether you have received it or not. So there was no way to verify in the UI. You know UI is uh, UI testing is quite challenging into automation, right? Uh, it is very difficult to maintain all those pass rates, failure rates, and everything. So, and many a times those are pretty dangerous. So, uh, I'll quickly dump, uh, jump into a demo where uh, there are a few aspects that I'll be checking. One is uh, just verifying a one to one messaging, it will be an end to end, and there will be no server involved in that. 
so all of you give demos and just i'm just playing whether this demo uh, this demo goes well <laughs> it's challenging but we'll give it a shot uh so uh i have four devices connected over here out of them three are rendered out different os versions and one is ios so you have seen the app has been launched in two different phones the first the third phone has started a chat with the another user maybe your friend maybe your uh family member or mother father and uh, anybody you can chat with uh you can also send all some high stickers over here and the best way to verify we want to verify every single detail that is that is being appearing in the ui we are verifying the counters that are appearing over there we are verifying the stickers whether the same stickers has been received by your friend or, uh, or not because we might face issues where you sent a sticker and something went wrong in the server and some other sticker uh, another sticker has been received by the client so this is how messaging works right you send a message you get ma back a message send stickers and all so we thought why not take the take the testing automation framework to another level where it is communicating with various devices so this was just a small example where two devices were communicating with each other i'll, I'll explain few more examples where I'll, i'll make more than two devices communicating with each other simple example is group chat before that i want to jump into a scenario so if i want to if if i ask you guys how will you test how will, uh, so being in an instant messaging space we need internet to communicate with each other right or a data connection or a wifi or something like this what if i say you can communicate with your friends without using internet at all without consuming your data actually before we jump there sorry vivek uh did want to quickly pause uh so you saw a quick just demo right uh before this where uh we saw a simple one is to one messaging one person sent a message to another person and uh sent also a sticker uh and the other person received it right uh, so if you were to actually test this what are the kind of things that you would anticipate in this and what are the kind of things that you would actually test for this the time it takes to that would the time it takes to receive the message so then we can start saying okay some of these will fit into performance related stuff some of them will fit into the actual functionality related stuff uh we have another talk tomorrow where we'll specifically go into performance related aspect uh let's kind of focus this one for mostly the functionality related stuff so from a functionality point of view right uh vivek talked about a little bit in terms of you want to make sure the same sticker actually showed up the sticker is actually rendered correctly is visible all of that stuff but there's more interesting stuff that we actually verified under the hood right over there uh so what kind of things would you do so what happens if the other person is not online so the different network types you might want to verify different file sizes as in the the files that you're going to transfer uh but also someone brought about different versions of the app itself right so you can't expect everyone to be on the same version of the app so you might have people on different versions of the app we'll cut to that so there are more for Right, so you can see how we start opening the Pandora box, and you can very quickly just run into like all kinds of cases. Yeah. Uh, so I think Vivek kind of jumped into the next section, which is uh, in Hike we support something called as offline messaging, which basically means that uh, you can actually use Wi-Fi Direct and communicate with other people without actually using data or using going through the internet. Right. So we want to quickly see a demo on that. Yeah. Or you want to explain something before that, Vivek? Yeah so uh this We'll come to the infrastructure hang on that's that's the meat of the talk but we want to uh get a little excitement around the kind of things you can do so when we actually go about talking about the infrastructure you'll understand why some things are the, the way they are we just need to understand there's offline messaging there's other kinds of things right so we just wanted to make sure that we help you understand all the different things that is there and then jump into the infrastructure side of it just to update this is a local setup uh we support a number of devices that can be connected to a single machine and you can make communication with a number of devices at the same time and all the devices that you see here are real devices we are not using any emulators for our testing so just to jump into uh, i'll jump into another demo where there is 
a sample case which will verify the messaging without internet. So here again, I'll make two Android devices communicate with each other, and you'll you'll just just uh, note the Wi-Fi signal over here. It will just go off. And even then, you will be able to communicate with your friends and message your teachers. And even you can send file up to 100 GB. So, and it will be real quick. So, it, the other friend send request to connect it. You can type direct. Just wait for some time. Wi-Fi is turned off now. So, as you can check, Wi-Fi is turned off. And in one of the phone, it will get connected and it will get activated. That's the only three marks that can tell. Uh, so the first guy started a chat. He's sending a file. It sends a file. The, I am not using such any internet. Uh, no internet congestion, no data congestion. All you save is your money. So this case is very useful when you are trapped in a say a very remote place where you don't have your Wi-Fi and even your 2G is not working. So your friend is in another room or say in another hut. You can directly chat with him without using internet. You can send files, send pictures, and all. So it's right now it's 100 meter. So within 100 meter you can transfer files. So it's enough, right? If you, even if you are uh, staying in a similar apartment, say 14 floor or something like that, it will work. So it's okay. So yep. Uh, this is completely based on Wi-Fi. So it creates a channel. You just have to just get your Wi-Fi. Just Switch it on. That's it. All right. Let's jump into a little bit more details. Uh, thanks. So until now, we saw that only two devices were communicating with each other. What if I extend? What if I have some scenarios which require more than two devices? And so uh, the best example is the group chat. I'll take a very specific scenario uh, where, say, suppose I create a group chat with two other friends, and I, I named the group chat as, say, Wow or say, Hi friends, and something like this. And the group chat name that appears on other mobile with the friend. This can be a case, right? This can be a corner case. This can be a boundary, boundary case that we might miss. So here, now you can see the three devices are connecting with each other, and all this is happening in runtime. I'm not assigning any devices into a test case. Test case makes a request to some location, and uh, the device has been allocated. It sends messages. Can pray now. Yeah. Let's drop that again. Hmm. So uh, right now I'm using Atlas because it's in my local setup, and uh, nothing is happening in Atlas here. So, that's fine. I think we could skip this. Yeah. Uh, this so, still we can see uh, the three devices simultaneously brought up high cap and. They are communicating. They can communicate with each other. Something is wrong. Uh, yeah. So here, there can be a specific scenario like transferring files to multiple OS versions in Android might cause some issues. And same thing can happen with messaging or some other feature that we provide. 
So important thing why we wanted to show this demo is that a lot of times, at least in the past when I've done any kind of this testing, you mostly are testing with one device with, you know, making sure that it communicates with the server back and forth like, you know, Vivek talked earlier. But in, in kind of mess instant messaging apps or other kind of peer-to-peer -peer apps or think of games and stuff like that, where you actually are doing, uh, playing games with two phones, uh, you know, there might not even be a server involved, right? So in those kind of cases, how do you even, right, do testing? And so what we were trying to demonstrate is it's not just between two devices, it could be multiple devices, and we can still do the testing across multiple devices. And it's real time because, you know, you're taking the same test and running it across multiple devices. It's not separate tests running on each device. It's one test which is actually running across multiple devices. Yeah, so this was the demo till now was just using Android phones. But we are into a market where uh, people are using various OS, uh, OS, various OS platforms like iOS, Android, and all. There can be a scenario where a file sent by Android is not supported by iOS and it can make something go wrong. So uh, we thought of a plan on why not make these test cases run on different platforms simultaneously. I'll put up a demo again. Till now you saw two devices, then we moved to three devices, which were Android to different device versions. Now we'll move to a demo where all these four devices will be communicating with each other. Started with the first, the third Android device. So the best part of this is I'm not maintaining different test scripts to run on different phones. It's just a single point, a single trigger point, a single test, which is triggering all this stuff. So uh, Appium provides you to run multiple instances at the same time. And my script take care of switching between devices. Yeah, it's, yeah. So, so it's- Get into that. Yeah, we'll get into that, how we are doing that. So uh, anyways, Appium provides to run multiple uh, sessions, right? With different code numbers and all this stuff. Yeah. So this is happening something like, so you saw the app launched on the third device first. It, my script switched to the second device, did the stuff over there, moved to some other device whenever required. So it's totally based on my script. Uh, here you can see it created a chat with the uh, iOS user. iOS user, so we are verifying each and every details in the UI that you see. Even the user join events and everything. Now to verify whether the sticker that is being sent by iOS is being supported by Android or not. We started sending stickers. I am on different screens. Switch on devices, verify whether these devices is receiving the correct information, correct messages, correct counters, and everything. So with uh, here, I made proper utilization of my resources. So this is a local demo where in the starting two of the devices were sitting idle. But those can be taken by other tests when they are running in parallel. So I'll jump into that. So far, does it make sense? This is just like the quickly demo part of it. We're gonna jump into the details. Just to quickly recap what we've covered so far, we've talked about uh, running the same test across multiple devices, and the devices could be of different <coughs> operating system. We are, of course, using Appium under the hood, uh, but there are other things that we've built to basically make this possible, which can run tests, the same test across multiple devices, and you're able to connect across multiple devices in real time and verify if these are going. And we can also have a pool of these devices that you can pull on demand and use them and then put it back into the pool so that you don't have to hold on to those devices onto the single machine. Right now we're actually demonstrating all of this machine, but it doesn't have to be that way. Right, so that's kind of what we have covered, just kind of showing different kind of demos to showcase what we have done. Now we can talk about some of the challenges we ran into and then jump straight into the actual solution. Yeah, so, uh, this was a demo, so it is in a local setup, as you can see. Here we have a separate lab which handles all these things. Now I wrote few scripts which make multiple devices communicate with each other, including various OS. The question.
solution was the execution time. If I run it in my local, all my test cases, it might take a long, the execution time might be too longer. The next problem that we faced was to run the test in parallel. We searched in the market, looked into number of app, number of mobile apps that are available, uh, used many of them and we were using client server architecture. Uh, we just need one device and the other thing was a server. They can easily handle that. However, we came in, uh, came to solve this issue by uh, building our own uh, tool for this. I'll not jump into detail uh, on how we achieve those things. I'll, I'll, I'll just give you an diagrammatic overview on how the system interacts with each other. So the other problem, the, the problem that we faced was uh, the execution time which was like killing us. The build came and if I ask the developer to wait for 10 hours, they'll not wait at all. And we are moving in an agile environment. We have where we are working with different teams. We want to bug, we want to catch bugs as early as possible. So these executions should be as frequent as we can do. So quickly to just so the demo that you saw was essentially running one test case at a, at a given point in time across multiple devices. Now obviously we have like thousands of test cases. You're not going to run them sequentially. So what we're going to talk next is how do you run these tests in parallel across multiple devices? Yeah. So uh, we did not reinvent any wheel at all. There are a number of mobile labs that are in the market that give you parallelization that distinguish your test cases. We thought, why not make multiple devices communicate with each other as we were not able to find a solution for that. There were few, few solutions available, but being a tester, the person who is writing the script, should write it very easily, right? I just want to initiate my APM capabilities in my local, like I do WD Mail, all the local host, all those stuff. I don't want to go and change those IPs or make some configuration into capabilities, which can, I think, can we can achieve this from that as well. So what we did was uh, we built a system which distributes all these type of test cases. Right now you saw my resource utilization was not good because I'm running it in my local. Uh, in the starting, I just used two Android devices. Say suppose there was one other device who will require which, uh, say one or more Android devices, it will take the other device as well. We have 15 test suits which have around 5,000 test cases. If I, as I told, we want to check each and every minor details in the GI. Second, we built our own tool for parallel execution of multiple device communication tests. This is a system, as you can see, a single point, uh, single click solution for automation. You can just log in, it's just a web page, you can just log in. Select a template. So uh, one of the issue, w one of the thing that uh, we need to take care of is if I'm I'm making a change in one of my modules, I don't want to test a complete app when it is just in production. We have uploaded a number of templates in our system. If we want to, if we, if say suppose I made a changes to my group chat functionality, I don't want to check high carry. I don't want to check any any other functionality that is available over there. So we just upload a template which just contain only those type of test suits which only deal with test uh, group chat. So any developer who is making changes in his or her module can just execute his or her cases to check whether it is working fine. With, so this is a graph where we'll talk of some numbers, how we reduce test execution, execution time. With a client server model that I uh, that we started in 2014 when we started our uh, automation uh, building stuff. It took us around 12 hours to execute those test cases. 12 hours to execute. And this can be done only on staging environment or uh, just a branch below that. That time we were not into Agile. We slowly moved into Agile. And then we did distribution of uh, client server architecture that we followed. We used some labs in the market. We have our own lab uh, that is in the spread. And with the Dexter, the tool that you named, the complete tool that is running all these things, we named the Dexter. It came down to 1.3 hours. Now I can run my regression, the complete regression with every build that I'm putting in the market, whether it's, it is beta, alpha, internal build, whatever it is. 
So this is quite a good jump, right? From 12 hours, I made the adjustment time come down to two hours. So uh, right now, it's uh, the system. I'll, I'll, I'll cover it uh, sometime when I go through the architecture. So there are specifications. I'll talk about the what are the specifications. Yeah, I've get it. At 12, So this is the average time. I'm not talking about the best time. This is the average time because the runs that you give depends upon the number of devices available in the lab. If two developers gave a run, First, first run, uh, the second run will be in queue. We'll be waiting for first run to complete, and we have made some significant changes where you can make num a request to number of devices you want to run your test set. So, if you are giving a run, you say, "Okay, I don't want to waste many resources. I have uh, only 10, 10 size suits, and it's okay with me if I get the report in half an hour or so." Um, There's a lot of room for improvement. We're kind of gradually going through, started in 2014, yeah. uh, but right now. Each request for an entire build will knock everything down while we are in the process of actually only taking selective parts of it. So it's still not there fully, but on the way. Yeah, everything. Everything on rail devices. There are different versions, so the test will request which version of the app that it requires on which side of a phone, and it'll pick one of those based on that configuration. Correct. So your test cases would have a good mix so that when something fails, you would actually know, pinpointed that it's because of the version that this functionality is failing, not necessarily that you know the test failed and then you have to go and debug. So let's quickly uh, wrap the next one up, and then it'll give a little bit more clarity in terms of what we've been talking so far. So uh, these are two other components that are included in the complete process. So let me quickly take a look at my article and cover some of this. Test suite is a client side where you have a web page. Complete client side code where all the templates have been loaded up. Everything. Test case executor TCE is a middleware for us. And Dexter, which has all those devices connected to it. That is type of you can say a lab setup. So what happens is when you trigger a run, it picks specific test cases from the complete test suite, assign it to test case executor. Now each test case executor takes care of a single test case. Now if I have four test cases, it will go to four different test case executors. This is to enable parallelization. This is to enable parallelization. Now your test case uh, would have made request to our lab to an API. We have API integrated into our test cases. Where your test case make request to uh, the lab saying that I need one Android devices to IBM. The other test case make a request I need one Android devices. This API checks for availability in the lab whether those devices are available. Assign it to uh, just check uh, it, it checks in the lab whether those devices are available with respect to those versions. Responds back with the number of devices back to test case executor. So it requests for specific. Uh, OS versions and with specific hike version installed on it, like our app version installed on it. And that's what is returned back. Each test case would get access to a set of devices via desktop. That's correct. We'll come to that, right? Surely there are a lot of <laughs> question marks. Let's actually just make sure everyone understands this. Hold on to that question. That's an important question. Yeah, so as soon as test case executor gets the uh, devices that it needs, that it has to require. It executes the test run, collect the report. We collect device subs at the same time. We collect test subs at the same time. Uh, 
if we are running on the release build mapping.txt to just kind of create the device log, we provide with all those things in the report. Screenshots are available, videos are available, everything is available in the report. It sends back to the client and a wonderful report is shown where you can just select the test case with all those using the failure and the same is being sent via email. So there are a lot of things that needs implement this. Uh, the main one is scalability. Right now, a single Dexa instance supports up to 70 to 80 devices. We are working on scaling it so that more devices, uh, we can accommodate more devices into our lab. And even uh, by doing this, the test, test case execution time from two hours, we are trying to bring, uh, bring it down. Second thing is security. Uh, I went to a lot of stuff in Google, in the internet and everything. And a uh, few of the reasons that I find that the uh, lab doesn't allow devices to communicate with each other is security. On the same Wi-Fi network, they are on the same Wi-Fi network, they can be a security loop uh, over there. So we are working on these features right now. So so this being for us, at least everything is in-house, so for us security is not a big issue. But if we were to, let's say, decide to put it out for uh, other people to use it, then of course security will become an issue because you don't want random devices communicating with each other, uh, which is actually a core feature for us. We need, uh, but that can also be a security issue, right? Because we, that's why if you see most of the uh, real-time device farms that are out there, they don't allow devices to communicate with each other. And if that's not possible, we can't even run our tests, which is actually what got us started on this whole route. So that problem, security problem, is still kind of uh, not really addressed. Because right now, it being in-house, it's not a problem for us. Good question. We did not decide it. We said, first, let's try and solve the problem. We should be sure that it actually works for all our cases. And then the decision, I mean, Hike is not into, it's not a, it's not going to go and make a commercial version of it, right? That's not w business we are into. Uh, so it could be open source, it could be something you just keep in-house, uh, we've not decided that yet. Okay. I'll directly jump to q and session. Those are two kind of open issues, uh, right? And then there are other things like dependency management between the tests, maintenance of the test itself. Uh, there are a lot of other kind of things that are kind of common challenges with most. What we really wanted to demonstrate here is, you know, having multiple devices communicating with each other and running those in parallel. Uh, this seems to be a big challenge for most messaging related apps or for most uh, games and stuff like that. And that's the kind of problem specifically we were trying to address. Right. Emulator will not never give you the same experience, right? So we do use emulators for uh, you know lower level tests. Uh, so when a developer runs a set of uh, what we call as instrumented tests, there we do use emulators. Uh, we also have unit tests where it is without any Android or iOS dependencies. So those are all at the lower stacks. This is at the top of the pyramid where we are essentially looking at doing a full end-to-end -end check. And it's not, so we have a lot more tests below this. It's, it's really the, the, the topmost layer of the test where we want to make sure that it is as real as a user experience. So the question here is how do you manage the cost? Because if you're going to set up your own kind of a lab with all the devices and stuff like that, that's going to increase the cost. For us, you know, what for us, we already had a lot of devices because we had to make sure that we are testing. All we are trying to do with this particular exercise was to basically automate all of them so that we can shorten our uh, test execution cycle and give feedback as early as possible. So essentially getting to a continuous deployment kind of a model, right? So cost-wise is not a concern because we already had those devices. And uh, you know, if, if there's a lab outside that essentially gives us all this functionality, we would be happy to just use that, right? But right now, because of the security issue that we talked about, that's, there's a blocker right now. Uh, so uh, just to give you a quick uh, thing, we are using a very low end computer. And uh, there are some technical things that I can't uh, say here right now. But we are using a very low end machine. So machine, uh, the cost of So right now, we 
right now it's one physical machine which basically you are connecting 80 up to 80 devices is what we have gone up to uh, on one side so we actually want to increase that to lot more so th that's the one of the future direction the scalability aspect is 80 is not sufficient so for now 80 is good enough but as we start scaling uh, 80 might not be good enough so we're looking at actually how do we make this uh, you know more scalable from where it is but most devices you should be able, uh, most uh, hardware, standard hardware, you should be able to, I mean server configuration, I'm not talking of laptops per se, server configuration, but you don't need like a very high end server configuration. Most should be able to support up to 80. Yeah. Sure. So it's all USB hub or do you expect uh, USB of the? Uh, it's all USB through USB hub. Yeah. yeah, just connect a bunch of busy chain uh, USB hubs. Keeping alive is a good question. Uh, how do you keep alive all these devices while they're connected and rescue, uh, tested? Yeah, so as I told, the complete system, right, the last part, uh, I just go back to this part. This vector thing, take care of everything. So if the, some device goes out, there is a listener that keep listening to all those requests. If some device goes out, it sends a request, uh, reset the devices, bringing it up. Does the initial setup that we require right now? Because we don't want to do initial setup every time we get a test. Because right now we are only testing right. So there is some initial setup that is already done on the device. So we keep on tracking those things. So if uh, there are some uh, failures to write when some human has to go over there. Do something, but we are trying to reduce that as much as possible. Um, so right now, it's like two people. I think two people who essentially manage this. Uh, it's not like a big IT setup, uh, but yeah, I mean that's that's one of the reasons why we said this is not fully ready, right? It's not ready for either open sourcing or things because there are still issues around. You know, sometimes you have to go and physically reset because even though you're trying to do that, that through the detector, uh, it might not be possible. So, but those are not, at least I think in the last a month, maybe we've had like four or five cases. It's not, it's not like every day. Hang on, this gentleman has been raising his hand. We'll go there and then we'll come to you. No. Any other feature, right? So it's just one-to-one -one messaging, right? If I'm sending a uh, message to you, I need to uh, no. So uh, the reason that we get and something that we read to internet is security issues. So each and every device is uh, connected to a different FN system. So they won't be allowed to connect to each other. And even if they do it so, there are some IP configuration that need to be done. So this doesn't require any so to your question, if you were to just have uh, two devices, one device want to talk to each other through an internet, through a server in between, for sure uh, most mobile apps can do that, right? Uh, but because of the Wi-Fi Direct, because there are a few other features which actually require uh, the devices to be physically, uh, uh, not physically as in uh, directly communicating with each other, uh, th those are the cases where we won't be able to solve this. Uh, they also have limitations on how much data you can send and all of that stuff. Uh, like you can't transfer a 1 GB file over that. It'll, it'll cost us like a bomb. <laughs> Hang on, we'll go there. So as uh, uh, Vivek said, we actually have the same script that runs across multiple platforms. It's not, we don't write different scripts for different platforms. There's a nice layer of abstraction that we built on top of Appium, which essentially does that for us, so that it's essentially the same script that runs across multiple. It's very hard to kind of quickly say, okay, this is this is it. 
So sometimes we use different VMs because there might be some case iOS is using maybe friendly and Android is using different. That's the abstraction layer, right? Yeah. And there are some OS related stuff which is different in iOS and different in Android, like some pop up, some big screen, and all those things. So those things are needed to be handled differently. Yeah. already know what device you're talking to, right? Because at every point, you're basically saying that this specific device executes this step on it. And so when you do that, it's not, you don't need a conditional logic because that's all abstracted out in the uh, wrapper that we've written, which is essentially wraps around the, this thing. And so if you're saying, okay, there is a pop-up that's going to come, it's going to be handled differently on different devices. But that's the abstraction because you already have a handle to it, it'll handle, right? You don't it's it's uh, you don't have to have conditional logic in it. That's one of the things we tried really hard to avoid because if you have the conditional logic, then every time a new kind of scenario comes up, you'll have to go and change in n number of places. It's actually a mix of uh, we, we we kind of have a hodgepodge of things. We originally started with something completely random, then move to a page factory model. Uh, now we are in between a refactoring where we are kind of trying to move to a slightly different model. Uh, so it's it's kind of not fully ready. That's, that's it, It's still kind of half-baked. Hang on. Yeah, sorry. Your question: There are two different ways to verify this. One. Yeah. So the question is: uh, We showed initially a demo where basically uh, one client is sending a sticker to another device or a message. So his question is: How do you actually verify if that sticker or message is arrived on the other and is actually rendered correctly? So two, there are two things uh, that we can uh, we have implemented. One other thing is using image verification. So we use SQLy initially, bad idea. <laughs> yeah, because the maintenance was quite high. Every time I change my phone, I need to take a screenshot of every phone, store it somewhere over there. It's a quick win if you want to do something very quick and dirty, which is how we got started. And then that became like the precedent, and we said, no, we need to kill this to move to a different model. Yeah, so uh, at the back end, each sticker has some attribute associated to it. Now when I'm sending the same attribute from one phone to I just verify over there when I'm entering the picture. The actual rendering itself is all tested at lower layers, right? You don't need to actually verify that because that you don't need to verify across every communication. As long as a particular sticker, a image, a file, uh, this video, ton of different things, native cards, uh, each of those are actually tested at lower layers, whether you give this, it's rendered correctly or not. Uh, here in the end-to-end -end test, we are actually interested in if you send something, is it actually rendered? Uh, I mean, you're not actually looking at whether how it's rendered, the color and all of that. You're essentially ensuring that on the chat thread or whatever the thing we have, if this particular ID is visible on it. Yeah, some properties. Again, like we said earlier, we are not mixing up performance and functionality. We keep those two separate. So for this, was what we are mostly focusing on is purely functionality. Uh, we won't essentially check if you know on 4G how long it's taking in as part of this. We have a talk tomorrow where we're actually going to talk about for performance-related stuff how we are doing benchmarking and how we are doing across different network types, across different phone types, and all of that stuff. It's 
peer to peer protocol right never shows up on the server now you initiate a wifi direct someone connects to your wifi direct you're talking of uh, security testing in general about hike itself it's encrypted yeah, i mean standard stuff right encryption We won't have that detail, and we wouldn't even be able to release that, re reveal that if we knew that. Uh, correct. There are some issues around that, which is why we won't be able to reveal that. I'll I'll talk about that offline, not on the camera. What do you mean delta? So luckily for us, we don't have that. We try and ensure that it's the same experience across different OS versions. Uh, otherwise, it would be a very bad experience for a user when they shift from one OS to another. So we actually, uh, luckily for us, we ensure that the experience is same. However, there are only certain features that are available in Android, for example. They, those features are not available on iOS at all. So for in those cases, the, those are uh, the test cases are specifically written only for Android devices. Going forward, that's our direction. But right now, we have uh, feature uh, parity is not at the same level. Uh, because of again certain limitations in OS, for example, in iOS you can't do certain things. On Android you can, right? So right now we are trying to move to make sure that the compatibility is the same across devices. Uh, so where we don't have, we simply only request those devices from Dexter. Right? Sorry, we'll go there quickly and then come. Tell you that uh, I'll not go deeper into the details of this. So we have used uh, Docker, and we have used separate VMs to handle all those things in Dexter. Test suit is simply a template kind of thing where you put some. It's a test. Test suit is homegrown. Uh, we are using Cucumber. We are using other kinds of things to basically manage the text execution and stuff like that. Uh, Dexter is homegrown. It's all handwritten stuff. Uh, Although that is not really. APM is there, uh, of course. So basically, we named it Dexter because we want to make it a simple automation tool kind of thing, which handles all your requests. You just ask Dexter something, and it will send you the request. Whether you ask it for devices, you ask it for API tag, you ask it for some other thing. Uh, I, I can just uh, let you know the programming language that I have used. It's Java, simply Java, and uh, all it's those. It's a Java server that runs. I mean, again, there's certain difficulties we have in terms of revealing everything here. Uh, I'll talk about those reasons why uh, we we can't get into specific details around here. Uh, but it's a standard Java server that we have built with pretty much handwritten stuff in it. Uh, again, I think this is pretty straightforward it, right now it's just a connection it's a it's a pool of devices uh, with a server running on top of it which allows you to connect to these devices request these devices uh, and manage them uh, the test suit again is a java client that we've built a uh, java server that we've built which again manages all the test execution reporting all of that stuff this could technically be replaced by something like jenkins or whatever but this has something more specific that we have done so you know instead of trying to build a plugin we just hand rolled something ourselves Each of your test ex uh, executor, right, will essentially run in a separate Docker instance. Uh, there are a 
are specific reasons why you would want to run it on different Docker instances, right? I think the last talk actually he did a really good job explaining that. We were hoping that we just build on top of the last talk and not have to. Actually, this is why we're not talking much about Docker here, because we're like just the session before us went into deep details of that. We just thought, okay, we'll just build on top of it and not go into details of Docker itself. Sorry, uh, yeah, you've been. this question so uh, running multiple instances everything is taken care of no so Dexter just takes a request of number of devices pass those devices to TypeScript executor and TypeScript executor takes care of all the cases of the execution of spawning number appm instance yeah, is done in TC The port is given by Dexter, but DC would actually bind to it, create the Appium uh, instance and all of that. So you get Sure. Because you want it to be scalable, right? Not decided up front. Because unfortunately, you can't physically run multiple tests on the same device simultaneously. It's only one test that it gets executed. So the next request that comes, if no more devices are available, it actually goes on a queue. have multiple devices yeah of the same configuration you would have multiple devices of the same configuration to parallelize it which is what we are saying that right now it takes about 90 minutes or so for us uh, with the about 80 devices that we have now we want to actually replicate that to run more tests in parallel of the same configuration OS version hike version other kinds of constraints you know the phone type itself and have same instances available multiple of those so that you can run more tests parallelly. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not open sourced yet. Yet, or I don't know if it'll ever be open sourced, but I don't know. <laughs> All of that would be part of uh, the application itself, right? Like. Low layers of tests would actually verify that, right? You don't want to have one test trying to verify everything. Here we are essentially making sure that communication across multiple devices is working correctly. That's really our main focus. There are lower layers of tests. We have about six different layers of tests, which each verify a specific aspect. So there is a UI test which only verifies the look and feel on the UI, how something's rendered on the UI on different devices, landscape, portrait, yeah, right, like so many different permutations, combinations, offline mode, online mode. You don't want to do all of that here. So you actually push those layers down and handle them at the respective layer. Test cases have to be independent, right, if you want to run them parallelly. It, it's easy said than done, I know. <laughs> like, he's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> But of course, you have because you want to run them in parallel, you have to take extra care to make sure your test cases are actually fully independent. So you can get dependency among test cases inside your test cases. So if the same, so if the same test case, if you put some dependency on test case, anyways, that old test class needs to be executed on the CPU itself. So we can maintain the. So 
is not a good practice, right? But it's not a good practice. So if you see majority of our test cases are independent, you can just execute them directly. But there are some cases where certain steps need to occur before them, right? And those would have some kind of a dependency. Again, uh, you know, there's a lot more work for us to be done in terms of making sure a uh, lot of tests are still at the top layer, which actually we are trying to push down to lower layers. Uh, you know, because right now 5K, in my opinion, we can actually bring it down to about 1K. Uh, because the about 4K tests can actually be pushed at lower layers of our application. So because of that, we actually have some dependencies, but those are inside one test class, and that test class gets executed as a whole. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to push most of them down, so each one can be pretty much independent of each other. We've done this in other places, so we're quite confident it can be done. It's just going to take some time. This is at a class level. We are saying inside a class there are methods. We want to also get each method to be independent. Not uh, So we have already at the class level, but I think we want to get to each test method should be independent of anything else. So you can just execute a specific scenario uh, on a specific type of device and get the feedback without actually having to run the whole class. Right now we have to run the whole class. Right? The gentleman over there. There are some which don't require just one device, right? There are, there are some which require just one device. So there are things that you can do on your phone, like play games on your own, right? That requires just one device. But there are ones where you require more than one device, and as shown in the diagram, that, that guy is requesting one Android and two iOS devices. So it will get back a handle to three devices. Yes. Is there a limit on the executors? No, but the problem is if you don't have devices, if you keep spinning executors, then it's not going to be useful, which is the bottleneck we are running right now into, which is why we want to scale up on the Dexter side to have more devices available. Right. So basically, when you write the script, right, uh, in Cucumber, the way we write the script is in the, in, the, in the given part. We essentially say that these are the devices that we need, right? And so it holds on to each of the device. And then they say device A sends a message to device B. So then device <coughs> A, you would basically take a handle, send the message. Then whenever you encounter device B, it will switch to the device B and send whatever, uh, execute the step on it. iOS still is a big, 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 big issue. So we keep on getting pushed up with iOS. But I think in Android, we can easily handle it. Yeah, so in my first video, when one guy was typing something, there was three dots, right? That was a typing mistake. So we verify the attribute. Again, I'm saying the attribute. But when you are on the conversation thread, where all your conversation are there, you get a message like this is this particular guy is typing. So we can verify that. The question was basically uh, more from a concurrency point of view. How do you test concurrency? Uh, and so there are some parts of concurrency which will get tested in this layer of test. But a lot of concurrency related stuff would actually get pushed down to lower layers because there you have a lot more control and you can actually simulate different kinds of things uh, and so forth. So a lot of, simil uh, lot of concurrency related stuff is actually pushed layers down. Uh, here it's more of communication, like I was saying earlier. That's our focus. Obviously, there is a tendency, and this is one of the things we are struggling with. The tendency is to actually try and do everything in one test. And it's actually a really uh, easy th thing to do, but essentially ends up basically making your test very fragile. So we've like really working hard to try and make sure that we push things to lower layers of tests. So concurrency is one, performance is we've separated it out. There are other kinds of things that are also pushed down. There are API dependencies, other kinds of dependencies, those are pushed down. So here we are mostly assuming from an API point of view, other point of view, it's a happy path scenario. Client, 
whatever test cases you have uh, selected, when all of them get over, you get a combined report out. Twelve hours to about ninety minutes. Again, that is not parallelization, right? So if I want to run 10 test, 10 test cases on 10 different devices. You're talking of client one to one. No, you're talking about one to one, or you're talking about multiple devices talking to each other with different OS versions. When you say across five devices, as in you're talking about one test case runs on one device, doesn't require other devices. In our case, we actually require for a particular test run multiple devices, right? That's how we can actually verify that a cross-platform uh, messaging is working correctly, cross-platform other kinds of things are working correctly. So for our specific scenario, it's not like you only need one device. Uh, there are few cases which require only one device, and as and when they're available, they'll run those tests. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, we've kind of almost written our own grid in some sense. <laughs> we've essentially built in some sense our own grid implementation. Uh, there are reasons for that. We can talk about it. Here for projection. Now for projection. This is not how we'll do testing. This is only for projection. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we. So we can implement it using various number of tools that are available. Like GNC is one of them. But in our case, anyway, you let these tests run. The video will get recorded if the test has a failure, and you'll get that. You don't actually need to sit there and watch it run. Uh, it doesn't make much sense to do that. Yeah, why not? That's why these are all separated out and there is a reason for using Docker instances to kind of keep that decoupling, right? So tomorrow, let's say Sauce Lab or Browser Stack decides to provide this functionality, uh, we will just chuck off all of this and just move to that, right? It's just easy to do that, so we don't have to maintain these devices and stuff like that. The problem, though, is these guys won't have specific devices that we need, and so there are other kinds of problems that we also have. In fact, if you come to tomorrow's talk, we will talk about how we even go about figuring out what devices we should test on. Uh, it's it's not just randomly pick whatever devices you have, right? You have to do some uh, pretty interesting analytics profiling of the exi existing user base to figure out which devices you want to run and so forth. So we'll talk about that, and th that might be a problem still, even if someone is available in the cloud, whether they'll be able to provide those specific OS versions on specific device. Some devices are not available outside India at all. <laughs> so you can't expect like Sauce Lab to provide that. <laughs> iOS, I don't think it's possible technically so far, but yeah. Technically, it seems possible. We've not tried it. Technically, it seems possible, but we've not tried it. So when we try, we would know. The question, obviously, would be like, what's the incentive, right? 
uh, because if this is actually working, load balancing. I mean, right now with 80 devices, we like that's that's a lot actually. Like 80 devices, and we're able to run this. Uh, as we scale, obviously, we'll have to reevaluate. We're also looking at ourselves scaling Dexter itself, so we can run, we can connect a lot more devices. And if we are able to do it, it's just a lot more cheaper and easier for us to manage it. Not necessary, uh, but right now it is. Right now it is, but we are moving to a model where that's not necessary. All right, I think we've overshot our time. Thank you again uh, for listening in. Hopefully this was useful. Thank you.